Um, so today will be the last lecture where I'll be talking about uh, Unit 6 and Project 2. Um, and we're going to continue on with Unit 7, which is lots of fun with data, um, which leads into Unit 8, which is one thing you can do with data, which is lots of machine learning, which is and we're going to pass the torch over to Yoni for that, for that last component. Okay. Um, and uh, and next week we've also got um, Anna Anna coming and giving a nice talk, so that'll be good. Um, yesterday we went through our event simulations. We did um, not just one, not just two, but three examples of of, of simulations and how to write a simulator. Um, we ended up with this more structured approach, right? So remember, you can use this approach um, with your uh, project two. Um, I believe that was part of the tutorials. Um, so you should feel somewhat comfortable with that. Um, the only thing I might suggest changing is, is that you can start with an array of or a vector of initial events. Um, and that's all fun. We went through the heat data structure. Uh, I won't go through that again, but that, that was the thing which let us find the next event in time really quickly. Um, and we ended up with a quick quick talk about modules and modular software tonight. So I'm going to just recap this a little bit because it'll lead into the packages that we'll do in a minute. Um, and then we'll go through a little bit of uh, other kind of simulation and Monte Carlo techniques uh, before moving on to um, Unit 7 and data. Okay, so that's where we are. Um, does anyone have any questions or any queries before we begin? No? Okay. So packages and modules in Julia are there to help us do modular software design, right? So what does module like modular is a sort of generic word in English, right? Think of Lego bricks, they sort of just fit things, modules just fit together. Um, and that's many programming languages have ways of doing programming in a modular way. And the reason you want to do it in a modular array is, uh, for example, um, you can hide details away that you don't have to care about. You can just use some interface. Um, like you don't have to understand how the internals of that heap data structure works in order to run an event simulation using that event simulator framework, right? Um, but the other thing is you could have people working in parallel. So I could be on a team. I might write a library and a colleague might import my library and write some user-facing code with that library, okay? Um, or you might have a hundred different software engineers working in a company and they can all work on different modules independently. They can all deploy them production independently. Um, and, and, and that will, the system will, as a whole will sort of still fit together like letter bricks, right? Um, we spoke a little bit about modules in Julia. So I'll, I'll just go through and we'll play at the REPL with some of these ideas with these modules. Okay. So, um, there's the syntax for module. It's a bit like function or whatever. You could theoretically indent everything. We don't tend to because often we have the whole file is, is a module and there's no point indenting every single line of a file. It's just kind of redundant. Um, uh, but yeah, it would, otherwise it would look kind of like a, a struct definition or a function sort of definition. Um, yeah. Now, what, what are modules? So Okay, so we have these modules. Like I said, we have the core one which has things like the compiler in it um, and that has um, like functions inside of it, like that one, which the compiler will use to do things. So one of the cool things you can do with this function is you can ask kind of the, the what's the return type if you call sign with like a float 64. Um, and this is the, the function which does this call type inference algorithm for Julia. All right, inside the compiler. And there's all sorts of other functions in there that help Julia turn your code into machine code. Okay. Um, there's the base function, which which is the one which contains sign, but it contains like plus and it contains integer and it contains all these other different things that we tend to use. Um, and then there's the main function, which which is a, a main module. So let's let's have a look at this. So, so the main thing is, is a module. And every time you start the REPL, it just creates a new main module, okay? So um, if I go like main.x, there's there's no x in it, but if I go x equals five and then go like main.x, then we have it. So let's have practice writing some modules. So I can go like module A, 
right? And I can say inside module A, maybe thing equals 42. Um, one thing I can do is I can export thing, right? And I can go, oops. Uh, there's two P's, it doesn't like that, does it? So I had a typing error, and then I can go in, all right? So this is a module. So if I go A dot thing, there's, there's 42 inside of it, but I don't have access to thing here. If I want to kind of import those exports, then I can go using dot A, okay? Now, what's the dot mean? Do you use the dot whenever you have a module in RAM, in memory, it's already a part of your code? Okay, so modules are, um, um, yeah. And if I went using A, what it's going to do is it's going to try to use the package manager. We'll talk about packages in a minute, but packages live outside the Julia language sort of virtual machine kind of thing. Packages help you find files, load files, and then import modules from those files. So now I've typed using dot A, I've actually got this thing. Okay, um, and that's all fine. Now I could have gone import dot a like that, um, and that would have given me access to a. Well, I mean a is already in scope, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but it wouldn't have it, the the, the naming's a bit backwards. But it wouldn't have imported those exports, right? If you use import, so there's import and using, and they only differ by whether those exports are automatically brought into scope. You can still access everything in by going module name dot thingy, right? That's fine. It doesn't have any like semantic difference. It's just a um, usability difference. Now, some people would argue you'd always want to use import. Some languages only import, only support the import kind of semantics, because if you have multiple modules and they're all exporting different things, they might export the same name by accident, which is a problem, because these people writing the different modules aren't necessarily talking to each other. They might not even uh, be in the same country, the people writing those modules, right? Over here. Oh, so export is the so export was the thing that that brought when I go when I go like using base for example that's how come I know that that sign is in in so I'm I'm in I'm in main at the REPL right but sign has been brought in because by default Julia will import base now there's this keyword also called bear module right um, bear right and this thing really doesn't have much in it. Um, like this thing won't have sign, for example, in it. Whereas A would have had sign in it because it would have by default imported base. But that's just the de default. You don't need to import base. Um, not much you can do without it. You'd have to start from scratch. Uh, but yeah. Um, there's a kind of path system in modules. So I can like create a module B and I can go like using uh, dot a and so this is importing a from my parent module um and then i can go like other thing equals like thing plus one that should work and then b dot other thing should have been 43 okay so it's 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 imported thing from a which was in my parent module scope and I've managed to use those dots to import it. So remember when you're at the shell, right? I can go like cd dot dot things like this, right? And then cd dot dot and it takes me to my parent directory and that's where these dots are coming from. If you ever use dos, you could like go cd dot 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 and it'll go up two directories or cd four dots will go up three directories and that's the kind of syntax we're using here. Um. Yeah, so we'll go back. Cool. Oh, I quit. I didn't really mean to quit. But I guess we didn't need those modules. Um, but modules are like, a, they're just a data type built into Julia. Um, they behave a, loop, a lot like a struct that you can dynamically, like when I'm at the REPL in main, I can add new variables, like add new elements to that module um, dynamically. So it's like a struct that doesn't have a fixed structure, right? It's, it's a more dynamic kind of thing. Um, in unit four, I talked about the different types in Julia. I told you there was like primitive types, structs, and mutable structs, and things. And the one thing I didn't really tell you about is this module type till now. So it's another kind of thing built into Julia. Um, 
So the way we typically use a module is, is we want to encapsulate something in it. So we've got this max heaps one and all it does is export max heap. And, but it has all these other functions and things inside it, like sift up and so on, uh, which help maintain the order, maintain these invariants um, when you modify this max heap. Um, so they're all here um, inside this module, but you don't need to know about them, right? You only need, you can create a, ma you can import max heaps or using max heaps, um, create, create a max heap and, and, and use it um, in your code without needing to know all these details. So that, that's where modules are really useful. Um, and modules are very much a language concept. Um, in Julia, the, the files are decoupled from modules. I, I could have a single file and go module A and module B and module C end and have lots of modules in one file. Or I could use this include keyword. So this include keyword like goes and fetches that another file and reads it and basically paste that code right where you put it essentially. It's not a simple string copy. It will have to try and parse it. So that has to be a parsable file, but it'll bring it in and all the variables that are in scope and everything will be as if you wrote it here. And this means that when you're, when you're doing a project, um, you uh, can split it out from multiple files nice and easily. And you don't have to really think much about namespaces and scopes and modules, but you can still put things in different files. Um, yeah. And then there's packages. So packages are essentially a convenient way of packaging up um, some files, uh, well, a module, which might be spread across multiple files, packaging it up, packaging, um, talking about what that, that module depends on and needs to run, um, you know, give it a name and things like that so that you can export it and give it to other people and they can just download it, okay? So the package manager is its own program. It lives outside the Julia programming language. It, it's a program written in Julia. Um, but what it does is it basically involves like multiple things. There's like a web server somewhere where you can upload your or, or register packages you create, right? Um, and when you go, like, if I go, um, if I go something like using plots, right? I think I, I uh, here we go. Uh, plots is not found, but a package for plots is available from registry. So I'm going to say no because it's a large one, right? But I could go, um, I'll just use one that I know is relatively smaller. Uh, well, we install that one. And hopefully this won't take all day. Um, and it will, will install that for us. Now, uh, maybe it will take all day. We'll see. <laughs> so, so, so this package system, um, you know, it, it, it has, each package has a name and uh, not like an identity and it has all these different versions. So you, so packages get upgraded and things like that. Um, and then once you, once you identify a package and its version, you might want to go get that code and bring it to your computer and then compile it. And so that's what this has done. It's brought that down from the internet. It's, um, added it to my environment and, um, and pre-compiled it for me. So it's done lots of things. Um, and, and now I have all these things, you know, that, that live inside indexing, which you don't really need to know about for this purpose, but it's just a package. Um, so packages consist of certain things. Um, they consist of a module. So a package named foo, right? Must contain a module called foo, right? So the name of the package, the name of the module is the same. Now that module might contain some modules, like more modules inside of it. That's fine. That's perfectly okay. But but it always sort of is one-to-one -one between a package and a module. Um, and also that that file has to live in a certain place in a directory like source called foo.jl. And there must be a package.toml file. Now let's have a look. So toml is like an INI file from Windows, old, old Windows, um, if anyone knows what that is. Um, but let's have a look at that. So I'm here at home Ferris, right? I'm going to go uh, generate a package, um, my package, all right? And now we're going to open that in VS Code. And we'll have a look in VS Code. Um, if you're not using VS Code, I do recommend it. Uh, it does work well. Um, it's extremely fast to start up, as you can tell. <laughs> 
Yes, I trust the authors. Okay. So uh, there's this package, Tomal. Now, when I said a package has a name and identity, th this UUID is a, a, a universally unique identifier. Okay, here you go. Yeah, Tomal file looks like this. It's just a bunch of key value pairs. It's just a text file format like JSON or CSV. Um, you, it can come with sections and have like, and like if you go to a more complicated package, there'll be a section with like an array of all the dependencies and things like that. Okay. So th this provides um, some basic information about this package. Um, for example, the name is necessary, all right? Because using this name, it's going to look into the source folder and look at this file and it's going to expect a module called that. Okay. So that's part of it. The other thing is some of this other stuff um, has to do more with when you're putting a package on a registry and sharing it with other people. Um, so the the unique identifier is about the fact that in a public, if you had a single central registry, you know, that registry could keep track of the names, right? And everyone would have the name. But in the real world, what we have is we have a bunch of private companies not sharing their code and they hold host their own private registries. I've got code on my computer. You might, I might be developing a package I haven't even published yet, but I intend to. And in the meantime, someone in the public registry registers a package with the same name. Now, I don't want everything to fall over. I don't want my private company code just to stop working because there's a name clash that wasn't there six months ago and there is a name clash now. And I don't want, um, you know, my, 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 my laptop code to stop working because someone publishes something. So this this identifier sort of says, I mean, this my package, not that my package, right? And then it won't get confused. It's sort of unique. So essentially what this consists of is a bunch of hexadecimal random bits, 128 random bits, essentially. And and they're quite common to use UUIDs, like all the apps you use, all the web apps you use, Facebook and all those things, you know, or every post or that would probably be identified by a UUID and stuff. It's a very, very, very common thing to do. Um, the the this this thing is just like a package like we saw before. Um, we can we can edit it. At the moment, it defines a little function, but you know we could have like x equals one, y equals two, you know that kind of thing. Um, we could be like using different things, and we could like export x and y, um, and things like that. So so this is the sort of thing. Um, and like I said, if you're feeling pedantic, you could indent the whole thing. And so it looks kind of like you can see where stuff moves. Yeah. yeah, so if down here, so I'm going to add the dots down here, right? If I, if I went dot using dot my package, that means outside the package X and Y would be visible, right? So, and then I could go like X, right? But if I did import, my package, I would have to go my package dot x. That's the only difference between using an import. Okay. So it really depends if you want to keep your the namespace that you're in clean and not just have random stuff thrown in it, um, you use import. And but if you want it just to be nice and easy to use and, and user friendly, you'd probably use the using version. Yeah. Um so that's how we can create a package. Um, the there's another file which you can that comes along with this project, which is called a manifest file. I, I won't I won't create one just here, but um, the manifest file it's optional, but it will not only do, um, like I said, the project file will tell tell you the identity packages you depend on. The manifest file will tell you the exact version. Um, it'll have a version. It'll have like a um, a hash of, of the code as well so that um, you, no one can like swap the code out from under you without you detecting it. You'll have a hash of it so you can always verify that the code that that package manager gave you was um, was the code that you should have gotten. Um, and in that sense, you can create like this immutable environment, this virtual environment um, with this manifest that has the version, exact version of everything. So if I come back to my code six months later, um, I won't get the newest version of every package. I'll use the version I had stored on my computer six months ago. And therefore, I'd get exactly the same code executed and exactly the same results produced. Okay. This is really important, if especially if you're doing something scientific, you want something to be reproducible. 
you know, if you did an academic paper, you'd probably publish that manifest along with your code so that everyone can do exactly as you did, right? Down to the byte, essentially. Um, packages, uh, the package manager can track Git repositories. So you can like check out the code, different branches, Git branches and things. Um, uh, and it can have like a unit test suite. So you can create like other files in here. So I can create like a directory called tests and, and a, a file called run tests. Yeah. Not JL, All right. I can't type for some reason. And then in here I can go like using test, uh, using my package. And then I can write a unit test. So this would look like test that X equals one or something like that, right? Whatever it was. You'd probably write more complicated tests, but this would help you check whether this package is doing what it should do. Yes. Well, it's like using data frames or using data structures or using anything. It's test is just a package. It comes with Julia though. It's called a standard library. Um, and um, it exports, amongst other things, this macro at test, right? And it, it'll evaluate something. And if that thing's not not true, if, it, if it's false, it'll throw an error. If it's um, true, it'll keep going and test do the other tests. And so you could have, let's say, a heap data structure, and you could test, you, you could put a 100 things in it and check that they come out sorted, that kind of thing. And that way you can get some confidence that your code is correct. So that's testing. Um, yeah. Um, so in general, uh, if you're if you're doing um, library development, you, you'd probably start with a package on your computer and you'd write some code, you'd write some tests, you'd write some documentation, and then you could publish it to the public world and other people could download it. Um, sometimes you do that just so you can download it on multiple computers or something, or so you can track the versions of it. Um, and I've written a few packages. I mean, other people involved in this course might have as well. Um, uh, all right. Yeah. Julia programming. Yeah, that's cool. So we were talking a little, I think we've covered code types and code warm types earlier, haven't we? So this, this one, um, are we going to cover this today? Why not? We'll cover it quickly. So um, someone asked before what this this thing here is, right? This test thing. So this is a macro. So what it will do is it, it actually modifies code and it will it will turn that expression to something like if x equals one, um, you know, do something good. Um, so that so the um, what happens is uh, the test framework keeps track of how many tests have passed and how long it took and stuff like that. So it tracks some statistics there. Um, and otherwise it would be like, you know, maybe it'd be like error test x equals one failed or something, you know. It, it would literally kind of uh, transform this code into code like that and then execute that. That's what a macro does, okay? Um, uh we, we talked a little bit about return type. So if we have a function like sign of, uh, I don't know, 3.14 or something, um, we can actually see what the compiler thinks um, the, the output of this thing is. So, <laughs> wow. Okay. So sometime in the last few years, they've actually moved the implementation of sign from using um, libraries and, and CPU instructions to actually implementing sign inside Julia. And so what we're seeing here is all the different steps that Julia does to calculate the sign function of the floating point number, um, which is pretty crazy. But at the end of this is, is, is the return type of that function. Okay. Um, so that's a really cool one to know. You can run code typed or code warn type even um, on your functions. And warn type is very similar. What a warn type will do is just show things in red if they look wrong. Okay. Um, 
And it's also using a, a less optimized form. So this one's fully optimized, this one's not. So it looks more like the code you wrote. It's easier to diagnose problems. Um, but basically, if, if if this was like an any, it would just be bright red and you could sort of say, oh, my X Julie doesn't know what my X is. Why is that? And you can make your code faster. Um, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, this one's really cool. And then the other thing, you can do if you really want your code to go fast is use benchmark tools. Um, so we we have um, functions like we can go like time sign of, uh, I don't know, like 3.14, right? And that will take not much time. If I, I can use um, benchmark tools, this will just take just a moment. Um, what that'll do real quick, um, is it'll actually run that function over and over and over and tell me exactly how many nanoseconds or whatever that takes. So I can really get an accurate estimate of how long things take. Um, so, I, and this again uses macros. So macros are cool, um, B time, that benchmark time. And so it, it will have um, run it many, many times over, uh, over and over again and decide that on average it takes a nanosecond on this computer, right? So depending on your CPU, it might take two nanoseconds or half a nanosecond, but yeah. Um, that's pretty cool. <laughs> what do we got? What else are we doing? That's fine. Um, do we have more questions about packages before we move on? Yeah, up here. Okay, why, why do we sometimes use the dot when we're using a module and why do we use um, not a dot for the packages? So Julia's decided to build in the package manager, but it's still, the package manager is still separate to Julia. But part of the syntax is if if, the, if you go using or import something that doesn't start with a dot, it, it goes to the package manager and says, what do you think the name that, you know, I've, I've got this name, can you get me the files that would have this module would you load that and return that module and then I'll start using it, right? And it does all these different steps. In fact, in the REPL there, it even asked me whether I want to download it or go to the internet, download it, recompile it, right? So it's doing lots of steps. Um, with the dot, you're still, you're just immediately inside the Julia language and you're just using a module that's already in scope. Okay, so you would only use the dot um, like I had this example here where I've immediate, or created a module and then immediately I was using it down here, um, call it. Or I could like include a file with a module. So this is like if you if your package contains submodules, you'd like include the file with that module and then go like import dot module name or something, or using dot module. Well, you don't need to import it, right? It's just the using to get the exports. You really don't need to import it in that case. It's already there. Unless you've got like submodule, like a tree of submodules and they need to kind of refer to each other. And then, like, then you've got to import them. But... Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So I just want to talk a little bit about some other Monte Carlo techniques. So Monte Carlo, we spoke about at the beginning. These are, these are a, bunch, a, a whole family of numerical techniques that use randomness to give us answers to different things. Um, and in a sense, our, our simulations that we're doing, the event simulator, these are Monte Carlo simulations, right? Where we're, we're rolling random numbers uh, for the durations and various things um, and and simulating forward based on randomness. So, that, so that, that's kind of a Monte Carlo kind of method. Uh, but in general, um, so uh, the, in general, you can use Monte Carlo to create like a statistical average over an ensemble of things, okay? So, you could imagine in our discrete event simulation, there's a whole ensemble of possible futures with different random numbers generated, right? So we're talking about the trajectories or realizations and we can plot different ones. Well, there's like an infinite set of, of possible futures all with the sort of probability for each one, right? And if you sum up all those probabilities, you get what? Um, and so if you're interested in something like the mean number of people waiting in the queue at time a thousand or something, um, for one of those realizations. So we could have one of these realizations XI 
Um, we could have something we want to calculate, like the mean number of people in the queue, G, right? And if we just average that over all possible, all kind of predictions, um, then we would get that. Now, what can happen is um, we don't really simulate all possible uh, futures, right? There's the space of possible futures or um, possible answers or whatever is too big. So we subsample, we just create, like we want to do a million samples, we want to do a million trajectories or a million time units or whatever it is, right? Um, so um, what we do is we approximate this and then we get some statistical error, right? Where our mean might be, our um, calculated mean might be different from the exact mean um, in, by some amount. And that will kind of depend on, you know, one on square root of the number of samples you take, generally statistically. Uh, but there's a coefficient here, right? That's the coefficient's the standard deviation, right? So it's the standard deviation of over square root of n would be the thing. Now, there's a nice trick you can do here uh, called variance reduction, um, where you do something called important sampling, okay? So instead of, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get my pen, I'll just write it up. because should have put it in the slide. But instead of going like one on n some um, g of x i, right? Um, I could do one on n. Uh, well, uh, I could talk about the probabilities of these things. So I could say some some things. So I mean, for the moment, we'll just we'll just we'll just go p i um, g of x i p i. Right, so I haven't really done anything. Yeah, sorry. It's going to be a probability. We're going to interpret this as a probability. Um, so I could bring this inside over here, right? So that's kind of like a probability, right? Um, uh, so let me just get this right. If I put it. I put an N here or something, maybe. Or PI on N here or something like this. Yeah, something like that. So, um, no, that's not right. We'll just put, we'll put the one on N out for some reason. So um, what we can do is, is now interpret this in a very particular way. Uh, so if we, instead of just randomly sampling I, we, we choose i according to this probability p of i. And then if we know p of i, right, um, we could do that. And then we could take our thing we're trying to estimate from that from that sample and divide by p i. And what we're interested in now when we average all this is we'll, be, we'll get the standard error will depend on the standard deviation or the variance of that thing. Okay. So basically what can happen often is you, you have... Um, some estimator, and let's say G often is almost zero, and sometimes it's a larger number, right? If we can um, sample more often the, num the, the occasions where G is big and less often at the times when G is small, um, then the variance of our estimator goes down and we can get a better statistical estimate, okay? So this can actually be a really important technique because in 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 the limiting in the common case, let's say you're doing statistical physics, right? And you have an easing model. People were talking about doing an easing model, so a bunch of spin ups and spin downs. If you have n spin ups and spin downs, the configuration space is two to the n. And imagine for the moment that n is a million, right? So two to the million is a ginormous number. Now, if you consider a certain temperature of a system, um, the probability of any one of those states would be vanishing small, like one on two to the n. Right, one on two to the million, which is a microscopic number. But in reality, let's say it's a low temperature system, um, then only the low energy states are going to really have occur with any kind of probability, and the high energy states won't occur with much probability. Um, and you can, uh, if you can find a way of sampling, um, say, the energy of that system according to the probability of having that configuration, right, and then averaging that way. Uh, you, you can do much, much, much better, okay? Um, 
because instead of worrying about all these different states, which are completely unlikely and don't look anything like that system would look at that temperature, you'd, you'd always get samples which look roughly like if you just took a microscope and looked at something at that temperature, that's sort of like a kind of configuration you might observe, okay? Um, and so, so this is the kind of Monte Carlo techniques we use. We use them in physics. We use them in, in lots of things. Um, uh, yeah. And, and the way that we achieve that is that, let, let's say, um, often PI isn't something we have like a really nice closed form solution for that we can just sample directly. We use something called Markov chain Monte Carlo. So um, we might not know PI, but we might know something about the system. For example, um, in physics, if you have like a Hamiltonian system and you're looking at thermal equilibrium, um, you can come up with a stochastic process which will generate that probability distribution at its sort of equilibrium, okay? So you can go from like the Hamiltonian and the temperature and, and come up with a process such that the limiting sort of probability distribution is the thermal state at that temperature. Okay, and this is like the Metropolis algorithm. Um, so there are actually a whole, whole series of problems for which you could have some answer that you're looking for. Remember that answers some deterministic number, some estimate, right? Some, some expectation value of something. Um, but, uh, sorry. Um, but a really efficient way of solving this sometimes is to actually do this very indirectly and come up with some stochastic generator that will get you towards that uh, some distribution, which you can sample and then get you that answer. Um, and, th and that's sort of really interesting. Um, so we're, we're not, I'm not really going to go into the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. There's courses in physics where you'll come across it. Um, but the way it kind of works is all based on um, these Markov chains or Bayes rules, which is kind of the same thing. Um, where, where, if so, Bayes rule is this rule that um, the, if you if you um, know the probability of a given b, also if you want to know the probability of something given a given b, um, you can get it from the probability of b given a, probability of a divided by probability of b. Okay, and um, this doesn't look like much right now, but basically you can have this sort of chain of kind of events, right? And what we do is we keep applying Bayes rule. And so like, let's say you'd have configuration, say X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. What we're interested in something is like the probability of X2 given we had X1, right? And so you can work with with this this process that gives you this, and this is something like that Metropolis Hastings algorithm where you, where you do a step and you flip one bit, uh, flip one spin. Um, but this 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 thing is going to be sort of somewhat equivalent to the probability of like x four given x three, right? Um, and maybe x two and x one, right? Um, in in the in the in the if we just expand this out naively, we would actually get all the previous ones. But in a Markovian system, we don't actually care about X2 and X3. The Markovian system, it's it's uh, X2 and X1, sorry. The Markovian system is only the very previous one. Memory of the system, Markovian. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, I, I don't really want to dwell on, on some of this formalism, right? I'd actually rather uh skip over this a little bit um so we can focus on some of the data um part of the course but this is really fascinating um to me and it's something i've spent a long time in my life on um but yeah just just keeping that in mind as as a as a very important sort of method um where we can kind of use monte carlo to estimate various things um I'll skip over that. And we're going to talk about one more type of simulation that we do. There's this simulation is a bit more continuous. Okay. Um, and it's, this is going to be something which was really important a few years ago when we first wrote these lecture notes, which is um, virus epidemiological modeling sort of stuff. So like transmission of diseases and, and recovery rates and things like that. 
So imagine you had some kind of um, process which is sort of continuous in time, but sort of stochastic as well, called the SEIR model. Um, so susceptible, exposed, infected, and removed is the SEI and R, and they all have different rates. Okay, so there's a, some probability over some time or some rate over time that a susceptible person becomes uh, exposed to a disease, um, that that an exposed person becomes infected, right? So that's the containment period. Um, and that um, an infected person goes into this removed pile. So what's removed? So from the point of view of viruses, um, once you're infected, you'll either get better or you'll die. But if you get better, your immune system, you're now immune to it. So from the point of view of the virus, it, it doesn't really care whether you're dead or not, right? Um, so uh, we sort of consider remove the sum of, of dead and recovered. Um, just, just for this model. Of course, you could split them out. Uh, and hopefully most people survive. Uh, otherwise, you know, in this case, we've lost like 85% of the population. <laughs> um, but these are these COVID waves, like these waves like for that we had with COVID that we saw, um, where you have this dynamics, um, just starting on some basic rates um, of, of, of transmission and things. Um, and you can kind of see how, how as the susceptible thing drops, um, actually the rate of infection drops quite dramatically. In fact, not everyone ends up getting infected. There's a whole 20% here, which um, you've infected basically infinite time won't get the disease. Okay. Um, because essentially as more people become immune, the effective rate of transmission decreases and then it goes below some threshold and it tends towards zero. Um, and this is how we get all these waves. Some mutation happens and the process starts all over again. Or it becomes winter and the effective rate of transmission it goes up a little bit um, and you get another wave. So there's, like I said, I didn't do the details here. I wanted to skip them. Um, you can look in the notes for more details here. But you can do a lot with these kind of methods. And it, as applied mathematicians, um, you know, people in this course, you probably, you are likely will at some point in your life use, use something like this to do something practical in your life. So, um, and I think it's really cool. I think it's really fun. It's like simulating things and stuff. Um, and, and, you know, that's the, that's the kind of approach I'd like you to sort of take to project two even, right? Like it's, it's a bit of fun. You've got all these pretend people milling around and, you know, you can poke the system and prod the system and make them do different things. Um, so just sort of try, try and, be be the kind of experimenter and, and and figure out what's happening. Okay. Are there any questions? Any anyone want to ask anything about that? Uh that didn't work. It's because my seven key doesn't work. It's so annoying. Okay. Unit seven is all about data. So um just to remind you, this course has eight units. So unit seven is about data, and unit eight is about machine learning, which will we'll use some of this data. And both unit seven and eight will contribute to project three. Now, I know you're still in project two. You probably don't want to think about project three, um, but it's there. And so part of project two will be loading some data sets, and then part of it will be using machine learning on those data sets. Okay. So just to finish off today, I'm going to talk a little bit about databases. Okay, and then we're going to come back on Monday, and we've got a double lecture on Monday, and we'll go through all the different packages like data frames and that in Julia that we can use to load CSV files and, and transform data and filter it and group it and things like that. Okay, so again, as sort of applied mathematicians out there in the real world, we're always going to come across data, right? There's there's always going to be some data associated with whatever problem you're solving, you know, it's unlikely just to be one or two numbers that you're just going to write down in, in your notebook, right? So there's going to be some business data or some health data or something that you're going to going to start with. Um, and that data in the, in the real world, like software engineers build databases for that to sort of be stored in. So a database is a place that keeps your data safe and accessible. 
Um, and it's generally something like a server that lives on a computer somewhere hidden away in, in a building somewhere that you can't never, you, you'll never visit it, right? Um, and you'll, you'll log into it often through the internet these days um, directly to that thing. And you'll say, okay, I want to get some data out of it or I want to modify the data in some way, right? And that's the database server. Um, and there's database software on that, okay? Now there's different types of databases with different data models. Um, the most popular one is called the relational data model, okay? So, um, and they're relational databases. There's other types of databases, ones which work with graphs or which is key value pairs or, or different things. Um, but we're, we're gonna just look at the relational one because they're the most common um, and they have a very mathematical foundation as well. So, so that's sort of interesting. Um, for some of you, again, for this part, some of you already know this to death. You, you covered it, I don't know, at high school or something. And, and some of you, this will be new. So we'll just go over it all, just so we're all on the same page. Um, when, you're, when you're using one of these relational databases, you, you're going to come across this very ancient programming language called SQL, SQL. Okay. So SQL was written like in the 70s or like a long time ago. Um, and it doesn't really look a lot like modern programming languages. Okay, so so if you cast your mind back to the seventies, um, they started building business machines, and and they didn't want these complicated mathematical languages, you know, designed for electrical engineers and physicists and that that were programming ENIAC. They wanted something for ordinary business users who may be having their first exposure to a computer at all in their life, right? So they'll have like a little keyboard, um, and so they invented this language called SQL which is sort of based around English phrases. So it'll be like, select column from table and things like that. And you'll just write that out and press enter, right? And then it'll go and it'll get that column from that table. Um, you know, select column from table where date greater than, you know, yesterday or something. Um, and, and it will go and do it for you. Uh, but underneath it, underneath this sort of really ancient language, which is a bit crafty, but I recommend learning SQL because it's extremely practical. You'll, you, if you're dealing with data, you'll always come across SQL. So it's just a, a thing you've got to do. Um, underneath it is this beautiful relational theory. Okay. So as math people, we all know, we're all quite familiar with functions, right? If I go um, um, y equals x squared, right? That would be a function. So let, let, we've got this whiteboard. So what do we as well? So um, y equals x squared, something like that, right? And so what a relation is, it's actually a set of tuples. So what's a tuple? So if we had like x equals one, y equals one, that would that would that's a tuple. So it's it's like in Julia, the tuples or the name tuples, right? So it's a set of um, values. Um, and uh, uh, that satisfies this relation, right? But this, this tuple, y equals 100, that doesn't satisfy that relation, okay? But x equals 2, y equals 4 does, okay? And um, so that equation, that, that, that this is a functional relationship, right? It's like, you know, f of x equals x squared or something. Um, and in a functional relationship, you'd have some columns, which are like the primary key, um, and you'd have like, um, for every, you'd have like one element for every unique, like it would sort of be unique on that, say X in, uh, in, in this case. Um, so we can have other kinds of relations, other kinds of relationships in math. So, uh, y equals square root of x, right? And then in this case, um, this this isn't really uh, a direct functional thing because we've also got um, like the negative square root, right? So um, if we think of the function going the other direction here, like in this case, um, it's there's not for each input, there's not necessarily a unique output, right? So my, minus um, two, is also the square root of four. Okay, so or it's a square root of four. So um, relations are a generalization of functions. Okay, so you, you generally have a function like x equals a function of y z 
you know multiple things. So a relation, a, a, a relation, a tuple could have multiple things in it. In, in a general relation, there's no restrictions about columns being unique or anything like that. Okay. Um, and this is the kind of data that we store in a relational database where they might not just be real numbers, they might be like dates and strings and different types of data in these columns. Okay. Um, so that's kind of relations. Um, there, there's a few special cases that we can talk about. There's the relations with the tuples of size zero. Okay. So um, that. So, so I'm sorry, I didn't really talk about what I talked about tuples. What, what the relation is, it's the set of all these things, right? Of all these possible things. So in this case, if these are real numbers, for example, this would be an infinite size set, but still a relation. On the computer, we're interested in finite size sets, you know, finite amount of data. We don't have infinite hard drives. Um, and, but you might have things like the set of employees and ages. So it might be like, you know, Bob, Bob, and then um, he might be 42 years old. And, you know, Jane might be like 35 years old or something, da, 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 right? And this looks very much like a table where you have columns and rows. Um, and, that, you know, this is why we talk about tabular data a lot. Um, and, uh, but, it, but it's also kind of a relation. Um, and there's this, so he, he, here's an example on the screen here. Um, of, of a simple relation with three columns um, and three rows. Um, yeah, and so each, each like like in Julia structs or something, each column would have a data type. Um, this particular fun it, it, relation is a functional one because you know name is unique, right? There's not, or but in general, in a database, you might create an identifier like a number. Or one of those UUIDs for each employee, even if they have the same name, then you can still tell who's who. Um, now on Monday, we're going to come back and we're going to give some, we're going to go into some more details here. Uh, and we're going to go through an example of a relational schema. So when we deal with relations, we don't just deal with one, we can deal with multiple relations and we can have an algebra um, of ways of combining them and fill like. Like if I want to filter this one for everyone who's older than age 40, that's like a relational algebra, an operation in the relational algebra. But there's also the idea of joining table data to sets together to build bigger relations and other relations. So there's this algebra of, of operations that take relations to relations or combine two relations and produce a relation. And that's the relational algebra. And we'll talk about how, how that gets used in say a real world system like LinkedIn. Um, we'll, we'll talk about SQL, and then we'll talk about how we deal with this kind of data in Julia using data frames. Okay. So that's, uh, that'll be fun. Until Monday, any questions?